Again, we're going to be continuing our study, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. But before we can do that, we must do what we always do, back up, discuss what we talked about last week so that we keep everything in its proper context. And last week, we made our way through verses 10 through 12 of 2 Timothy 3. Now, there's something I want you all, when you hear 2 Timothy, you know what I want you to think of? That's what I want you to think of. The longest sermon series ever that you... No, no. But, but, but with 2 Timothy, this is what I want you to think of. This is what I want you to remember. Paul encouraging Timothy. Timothy, the, the elder pastor at the church in Ephesus, and he's struggling right now because of the false teachers, because of the congregation holding on to those false teachings. And, and it's wearing him down. And then you have Paul in prison, in chains, for preaching the gospel. And and what is he doing? He's heard about Timothy. He's heard about this struggle. So he writes this letter to him to encourage him. But but also, also church, to wake Timothy up, to, to shake him. He's saying you cannot be apathetic here. This is what you have been called to do. This is the desire that you have been given to preach the Word, to stand for it, no matter the difficult times you are in. Because the difficult times, they are a coming. You are going to be persecuted. But you have the truth. Oh, Timothy, lean into that truth. Can y'all, can y'all remember all that? Whenever you hear 2 Timothy, that should just pop in your head. Now, we covered verse 10 last week. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to rush through it quickly because if you want to hear it, you can go back to last week's sermon and listen to it. But look at verse 10 here. Because again, Timothy is struggling t- to stand for the truth, to hold to the word. He, he's in this wrestling match with himself. And look at what Paul, in this letter, look at what he wrote to young Timothy. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. Teaching. Paul was Timothy's primary teacher. Can you imagine that? That the second greatest seminary professor to ever walk the earth behind Jesus himself. That that's who Timothy trained under, the apostle Paul. But Paul is saying, you have to remember those years that I poured into you, giving you the Word. The the very inerrant, infallible Word that the Holy Spirit gave to me and I passed on. Now I'll tell you something else. Every single one of us in here have been under the teaching of Paul. When you go through these Scripture verses, you're hearing the apostolic preacher and teacher, and he is teaching you as well. So Paul, you've witnessed not only the God-given knowledge given to me. This is what Timothy, Paul is telling Timothy. But but that knowledge also determines my actions, which is why Paul goes into my conduct next. Because I guarantee you, Timothy, and what he is preaching and teaching right now in the state of mind that he is in, his conduct isn't lining up with the Word of God. So he's reminding Timothy, You have this truth. Your actions should reflect it. But because here's the thing, there's going to be false teachers that come into the church and they're going to know the word. However, they don't believe it and you can see that through their actions. This is one of the ways in which you can separate the true teacher from the wolves is their conduct. So Timothy, let your conduct line up with the truth. And this goes for every single one of us in here today. We claim to be believers. We claim to be brothers and sisters in Christ. So pay attention to your conduct as well. Even on social media, pay attention to your conduct. And then look what he says. My aim is in life. What what was Paul's aim in life? It was preaching the gospel and living it out. 
He was taking it to all the tribes and nations so that they would hear the good news so that they would come together and worship the Almighty Savior, the One who redeemed them. And Paul didn't back down from the Word. He didn't water it down. So what are you doing, O Timothy? You've seen my aim in life. This should be your aim in life as well. And church, this should be your elders' aim in life. To take the good news to the world to not back down from the world, to stand for the truth no matter what it brings. And then, my faith. Now we said last week that that Paul isn't talking about the faith in which regenerated his heart. No, No, he's talking about the faith here that the Holy Spirit has given him knowing that he has been redeemed, and because he knows that he has been redeemed and the faith that has been given to him, he knows that the Word of God is true through and through. And it's because of that faith that Paul, when he stands in front of the people, he's preaching the total Word of God. He's not skipping over the difficult parts. No, that's the faith that God has given this elder to not be ashamed of the Word. And that's what he's telling Timothy. You have that same faith. Do not back down. And then the patience. Timothy, you've seen my patience. You've experienced my patience. But here's a patience that I want you to think about, oh, Timothy. Think about the patience God the Father had with you, oh, sinner. This is the same patience in which you should be showing your brothers and sisters. This is the same patience in which you should be showing the unbelievers. A patience that allows you to endure with them. That's the kind of patience that Paul had during the most difficult times while dealing with the most difficult people. Patience. And and it seems here with Timothy, his patience has almost run out. And it's like, listen, Paul's telling Timothy that 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 patience, it it never hits empty. Not with an elder. God never lost patience with you. And then love. The way in which Paul loved people. it, It was a love in which he didn't care where that person was from, what they looked like, the color of their skin, their background, didn't matter to Paul. He loved man enough to share the gospel with them, even if that meant them hating him. But that's how he loves those who are made in the image of God. And what does that mean? That means every single person. Because let's not deny where we all come from. I don't care what the intellectuals tell you. Every single one of us came from two people, Adam and Eve. Not from monkeys, not from some ooze, but from Adam and Eve. We are all brothers and sisters. Now, I'm not saying that we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. That's only for the believers. But Adam and Eve, that's our parents. That's our bloodline. And that's what Paul understood. He wants heaven to look like a rainbow, a multitude of colors. I should say the new earth because that's when we really get our bodies. But that's what he wants it to look like. Red, yellow, black, and white, it doesn't matter. These are the people made in the image of God. And listen, there's also something else that comes along with that love. That person may end up despising you because you have to show them their sins That's what the gospel does. And they may end up despising you for that, but Paul loved them enough to risk that. And that's what he's telling Timothy. You too are to love people in that same way. And then steadfastness. Now this goes back to dealing with difficult circumstances. And of course, this is exactly where Timothy is. Difficult circumstances with believers and unbelievers, with the false teachers with the congregation holding on to those false doctrines. 
And, and let's be honest, it's tough dealing with sins inside the church. And, and you should be able to look to your elders, and your elders should be dealing with sin inside the church. But, but this goes a step further. Because that same steadfastness that's been given to the elders has been given to you also, congregation. And, and this is what I mean. Sometimes with an elder, instead of if there's an issue with inside the body, instead of the body actually speaking to one another, they automatically go to the elders. Instead of going to that person who offended you. Now, is that difficult to do? Yes, it is. But this is a command from the Word of God. It's not an option. It doesn't say you can pick A or B. No. If you are offended, you go to that person. You deal with that sin. Let me touch on this real quick. Let's go to Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Every believer is supposed to do this, not just the elders. But if you've been offended by someone... Go to that person. Don't go to someone else and tell them about it. Go to that person and talk to them. Give them that opportunity to repent of that sin to your face. You know, you know what that means? You've gained a brother. That, that brings you closer. Now, if they reject it, well, then you got to go talk to him again, but you take someone else with you. If they still refuse to repent, then it comes before the church. And if they still refuse to repent, then bye. But what you pray happens when you go to that brother or sister that has offended you, that they apologize. They see the error in their ways. And in that way, it doesn't have to become an issue with inside the church because you kept your mouth shut and you didn't tell anyone else about it. You just went directly to them. That's a beautiful concept, isn't it? But, but difficult times are, are also going to be not just with the persecution aspect of the world and what's going to take place at the church because of what we believe, what we hold to, but difficult times are dealing with other brothers and sisters as well. Okay, we're moving on, moving on. We're diving into verse 13. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, Deceiving and being deceived. It's amazing how much time Paul spends talking about false teachers and their wicked ways, is it not? Do you know why he spends so much time doing this? Because it can cause chaos within the body if a false teacher has made their way in and they're not being removed. It is like a cancer inside the church. If you let it remain, it will fester and it will grow. So Paul is being brutally honest with Timothy. This isn't going away. Until your last breath, you're going to be struggling with false teachers, with evil people, with those imposters. You're going to have to just accept it. You're going to have to rely upon the faith in which God has given you. The strength to endure by way of the Holy Spirit that has been placed inside you. And you're going to have to work on that gift of discernment so that you will spot those false teachers, those imposters, those evil people. And then, let's be honest, we live in a fallen world with fallen people. They, they do not like God. They do not like the Almighty Redeemer and who we serve. It's happening then, and it is still 
taking place today. But before I dive into to an example, I'm, I'm going to talk about an example. But before I do that, let us remember the promise in verse 9 that a true church may be, may be deceived for a while. Only for a while. But the Holy Spirit dwelling within those true believers, dwelling within those elders, they will see that false teacher. And the church will not stand for that false teacher to remain. So that, that's a beautiful gift that, that God has given us through the Apostle Paul. They will not remain inside the church. Now, this is what's terrifying today, especially in the United States. It seems like this is happening more and more. But, but let's go back a few years, okay, if you will. Do you guys recall a, a church in Seattle by the name of Mars Hill? The, the pastor who planted that church in Seattle, by the way, of that name Mars Hill. And Let me pause for a second. It's strange. You had two churches that were becoming very popular during this time, the early, the early 2000s. You had the Mars Hill, which was in Seattle, and this is the one that I'm going to be talking about. And then you had the Mars Hill up in Michigan. The Mars Hill in Michigan had a so-called pastor by the name of Rob Bell. He's an evil one as well, but that's not the one I'm talking about. So this is one of the reasons why we didn't call Christ Reformed Church Mars Hill Church. Not a good track record. Not a good track record. Okay, now let's, let's go back to Seattle. Early 2000s, around 2006, Mark Driscoll plants Mars Hill Church. And, and let me tell you something. In, in the beginning, I used to listen to Mark Driscoll all the time. Mark Driscoll came across as this man's man, right? Very forceful. Until he wore a Mickey Mouse shirt on the stage one time. That was weird. But anyway, but he was like this man's man. He spoke the truth. He, he, when, he, when he was preaching, he would exegete the word. He was going verse by verse. He was stepping on toes. And, and he started becoming more and more popular. So it went from Mars Hill just in Seattle to it started spreading along the West Coast. There were other Mars Hill churches popping up. But they wouldn't have a pastor standing before them preaching and teaching. A screen would come down or a massive television would be up and Mark Driscoll would be beamed in on that screen or that television. Then around 2014, a little probably around 2012, you started hearing some things taking place. And, and one of the reasons, this is called the Driscoll controversy, by the way, but one of the reasons... Mars Hill is no longer. It's because of a large number of former and current church leaders started lodging formal charges against Mark, accusing him of creating a climate of fear through his verbally abusive language, lack of self-control, and arrogant domineering attitude. In August of 2014, the board of Acts 29, the church planting network founded by Mark Driscoll, expelled him and his Mars Hill church from membership on grounds of his ungodly and disqualifying behavior. Now, it wasn't just what was taking place inside the church. Mark Driscoll started writing books. And in one of the things that Driscoll has frequently said that, that his favorite book of the Bible is Song of Solomon. He wrote a book titled Real Marriage in 2012 that is absolutely disgusting. It, it, it taught... I'm trying to clean this up. It, it speaks in ways of things that take place in marriage that should not be spoken of in the manner in which he laid it out. It was absolutely disgusting. But also with that book, he took $210,000 of the church's money and bought his own book, making sure that it made its way to the best sellers. So, so here he is, his book, Real Marriage, was absolutely disgusting, makes its way onto the New York Times bestsellers list. Do you know what that does? In doing so, it had the immediate and direct effect 
of boosting Mark Driscoll's earnings by $330,000. His earnings, with an indirect effect of earning of $180,000 more based on the buzz that led to media interviews for a total of just over a half million dollars. So, so he took the church's money, made an investment, putting his book on the New York Times bestseller. Then he starts appearing on all these talk shows. And behind the scenes, there are charges. His own church, his own elders are saying, this dude, he's not qualified for this. And yet Mark's out there making a lot of money. Why? Because the church isn't speaking up soon enough about this man. Now, there's more. There's a lot more. Just type in the Driscoll controversy, and you can see all this. Now, you may be saying, but but wait, Mars Hill, it's gone. It it collapsed. It shut down. Why are you you bringing up Mark Driscoll? Because he was removed in 2014. And, And like I said, Mars Hill no longer exists today. This is what's so concerning. Driscoll took an 18 month break, and during that time, moved to Arizona and started a new church in Scottsdale called Trinity Church. It is growing by leaps and bounds to this very day. You have a man who isn't qualified to be a pastor, who is a false teacher, who is an imposter, who is evil, who never repented of how he pastored the Mars Hill Church. And yet there he is in Arizona, still preaching and teaching. What's also troubling is he's making his way onto prominent conservative podcasts. He's made his way onto Stephen Crowder, to Charlie Kirk. And it's like, what are are y'all doing? Why why are you giving this guy a platform? But, But you see how destructive it can be to allow a man who isn't qualified to keep preaching and teaching. And really, at some point, we have to come to the logical conclusion that the only way a false teacher is to remain teaching and preaching is because that he's, the very church that he's an elder of isn't a church. Because we've been guaranteed in verse 9, right? That the body of believers inside that church, if there is a false teacher, can only tolerate him for a period of time. Before they see through it, and before he's removed. But it's not happened yet. So here's something that we need to be praying for. We need to be praying that Mark Driscoll is removed from Trinity Church and that a qualified elder is brought to lead, spiritually lead that church. Verse 14. Verse 14. So so we grasp why Paul sticks hard on this with Timothy, right? Well, while he's continuing to call out these false teachers because of the damage they can do. Mars Hill had well over 30,000 members. 30,000 members. And it just exploded without Mark repenting of a single thing. What, what does that do to the body? Okay, now really we're going into verse 14. Paul continues and he says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. Timothy, don't ever forget that you are a believer. Not saying that he's going to, but during those difficult times, Remember who you are. Remember the gift that you have been given, this miraculous, beautiful gift from above that you do not deserve. Listen to what God has done for you, O Timothy, by way of the Holy Spirit regenerating your heart, is that you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. You have this understanding of what Christ did for you. He went to the cross and He died for your sins. Oh, Timothy. And because of that gift of faith, you are a child of God. You don't deserve it. Not one bit. But Christ 
took your sins. He took God's wrath on your behalf. Lean into that, Timothy, during these times in which you are fearing, feeling weary, broken. Look at what Christ did. Look at how the Lord opened your eyes to the truth, young Timothy. Look at the knowledge that he has given you, young Timothy. That that truth of the inerrant and infallible word, that gift to be able to teach and preach. Oh, Timothy, and what are you doing? But here's something that is so beautiful that that, that Paul did here. and It's absolutely gorgeous, and, and I don't want to miss it. If you look at where it says, knowing from whom you learned it. Man, do you know who God used to introduce Timothy to God, to Christ, to the Holy Spirit? Do you know who he used, O church? His mother and grandmother. This beautiful gift, it started at home. Timothy's father wasn't a believer. So you can just picture his grandmother and his mother taking the Old Testament and and pouring into Timothy as a little boy. This is one of the greatest elders that the church has ever known. And it started with his grandmother and mother pouring into him at home. Man, if this isn't a wake-up call, Do not waste that opportunity you have, O parents, to spend that time with your children, pouring into them, giving them the Word, showing them what that true gift of faith is, telling them about their Lord and Savior. For you never know how God is going to use your child that wonderful, beautiful gift that He has given you. Notice I didn't call them uh, vipers and diapers there, right? They're, they're beautiful gifts from above. Pour into them. It started at home with young Timothy. That's where his foundation was formed at home. Now, he, he continued to to study, to grow and learn. Look at what it says in verse 15. And and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, here's something else that Timothy's mother and grandmother did. that they, They took him to worship with the body, to fellowship with the body. To to sit underneath the teachings of the Word of God. Now in the beginning, it it was just the Old Testament. That's all they had, so they they poured into the Old Testament. But as they they became exposed to what would eventually be the New Testament, when they became exposed to it, you, you had Timothy's mother and grandmother pouring into that as well with Timothy. He's sitting in a church hearing about the Savior. And more than likely, it was Paul who came in to their village and brought the good news. And it was then that that Timothy would begin to recognize from Genesis to the book of Malachi, that being the Old Testament, what it was truly pointing them to. And that was to Christ, to to reveal God's holiness, His majesty, and His love to offer forgiveness and redemption for those who trust in Him, who seek His grace and His mercy. Now there's something else in the Old Testament. It was the moral law that was given to man. But it was also understood in the Old Testament that man could not fulfill that moral law. That there was going to be one who was going to be sent who was going to fulfill that law perfectly on the believer's behalf. 
And here young Timothy is being told about Jesus. Jesus is the one who fulfilled that moral law that you couldn't. But then we have all the way back in the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned. What was that promise that God made to them? There is going to be a seed that is going to come, that is going to crush the serpent's head. And here young Timothy, he's being told, do you know who that seed is? It was Jesus. And then as young Timothy is going through the Old Testament and he's learning about all the sacrifices that take place. And in here, you have the New Testament teaching starting to come into the church. And they're saying, do you know who fulfilled those sacrifices? Do you know the reason why you're no longer having to sacrifice animals? Jesus. Jesus is that perfect sacrifice. And this is what Timothy is being fed at this young age because he had a mother and a grandmother that loved him. And God used them to pour in to Timothy. And it was because of Because of all of this, you see in how God is leading Timothy with his mother and grandmother teaching, the church teaching and preaching, Paul coming along in his life preaching and teaching, and then Timothy given this desire to do what? To do exactly what his grandmother and mother did for him. He wanted to preach the gospel. Paul sees that in this young man. Paul takes him under his wing and he pours in to Paul. He pours into Timothy. Paul pouring into himself. That's odd. Sorry. And it's almost as if Paul is writing this to Timothy to shake him. To say, do you, do you remember this? Do you remember this journey? Did you remember the reason why you had this desire, this burning to go out and tell others about the good news? Sometimes even for us, when we're going through those dark moments, we have to go back and look at our journey, our walk with Christ, and how it all came to be. And in doing so, we have to take the importance of that And why would we not want to share with other people? Why would we not want to tell them the good news? Why would we not want to pour into them what has been poured into us? Because that's what we've been called to do. Paul's trying to wake Timothy up. And, And sometimes, oh church, when we go through these verses, we need to be slapped. And, and, and this is the way. Remember what you have been called to do, believer. I look at verse 16. He goes and he says, or writes, I should say, all Scripture is breathed out by God. Wait a minute. Got a question. What does all mean here? I can answer that. I can answer that question. Okay. If you got your pen and paper ready, Here's the answer, okay? All Scripture is breathed out by God. So so here you go. That means every book, every passage is God-breathed. There you go. From from Genesis to the book of Maps, all God-breathed. We cannot skip verses. We cannot take the ones that we don't like and say, ugh. All God breathed. How did this happen? Well, in a supernatural way, God gave man the ability to speak and record His divine Word, giving us the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, points fallen man to God the Father. Points fallen man to Christ the Redeemer points fallen man to the Holy Spirit and how He works in the believer. Every single passage, every single book, God breathed. What do you do with that? Well, you believe it. That's what you do with it. 
God, through His inspired Word, has revealed His attributes to us. That's amazing in and of itself when you think about it. We get to learn about God, the Creator who spoke everything into existence. What have we done to deserve this? Y'all know the answer to that. Absolutely nothing. And yet this is what He has given us. His inerrant, infallible Word, which includes the Old and the New Testament. And in Paul writing this letter was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these very words from God. All Scripture is God-breathed. Timothy would read this letter to the congregation. Why? Because it was God-breathed. It was inspired by God. To deny parts of Scripture is to judge God's authoritative word. And who is man to judge God? And you may be sitting there thinking, well, that just sounds too simple, right? I mean, there's got to be more to it than that. This is the problem sometimes, church. Sometimes we think that we are smarter than God. Sometimes we read verses and like, but this can't mean what it really means, right? So I'm going to look and I'm going to put everything in context. I'm going to look at all the cross-reference verses and I'm going to lay it out there and I still don't think this is right. The problem's not with God, it's with you. This is quite simple. This is the Word of God. That's it. Well, how do you know that? We've been given the faith to believe that. But, but how do you know that? Because that's what it says. But that's a circular argument. I don't care. Well, that doesn't sound logical. I, I don't care. Does it sound logical that there was a man who walked on water? Does it sound logical that he went to the cross to die for your sins? No, that doesn't sound logical. You only believe that by way of faith, a gift from above, which is the same way in which we believe this is God-breathed because it is. We're not going to make it through, but we're going to go a little bit longer, okay? With this being the Word of God, with this being God-breathed, look at what Paul writes to Timothy. Again, shaking Timothy, waking Timothy up, and profitable for teaching. Do you know what the Scripture is calling you to do, Timothy, as an elder? It equips godly men, the elder, pastor, Timothy, to proclaim and also defend the core truths of the faith. God has given man his word in written form. So you better believe it's profitable for teaching. It's the word of God, for goodness sakes. Well, what else is it going to do? This is why it is so important for the pastor to preach the Word and not his own experiences. This is another reason why it is so important. Again, there's nothing wrong with topical sermons. I'm not saying that. But man, it can't just be all topical sermons. This is also why it is important, parents, to be teaching your children at home. It is profitable for teaching, but not just for your children. You need to be reading it and studying it yourself. Not just here on Sundays and Wednesdays, but at home. Christians do not need to be walking around with a secular worldview. It needs to be a biblical worldview. Well, what does that mean? It means you need to know the Word of God. That's how your decisions are to be made. Not by what Oprah says. Was that a double amen? First, first one ever, thank you. But no, 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 our decisions are made through the Scripture. Profitable for teaching. Man, from salvation to obedience, it's profitable for how we live our day-to-day -day lives, it's profitable. And you need to expect your elders to be teaching the Word. 
Just as the elders need to expect the congregation to be studying for themselves. And listen, if you come across something and you, you've got it in its proper context, you've gone to the cross references, and you're like, man, I'm still struggling with this. Call one of us. Call a brother or sister that you trust. Phone an elder. Get a lifeline. That's why we're here. And listen, if we don't know, I know it's hard to believe. We don't know everything. Then we're going to take the time and say, listen, just... I, that came across really arrogant, didn't it? Why would you expect us to know everything? Look at this guy standing before you. There's not one single person out there that said, I bet this guy knows everything, <laughs> right? That came across really arrogant. I'm sorry about how that came across. What I meant to say is, well, we don't know everything. Um, and then we should be able to say that. Look, I, I don't know what you're talking about here. Give me, give me a few minutes or an hour or two or maybe a day. Some of us, give me a week. Let me pour into this, and I'll, and I'll get back to you, okay? But that, that, that's what we are called to do. Ah. Man, let's hit reproof, okay? We're going, to go, we're going to hit reproof because I do know everything. We're going through this, right? For reproof. For reproof. You, you know what this is telling us? That the Word of God, Timothy, is used to point out one's faults. What? Yeah, it's used to reveal an error, an error, I should say a sin in one's life. But sadly, maybe like Timothy was doing, many churches today don't do this. We don't want to step on anyone's toes. We want everyone to come in and feel welcomed. We do want you to feel welcomed, but not by the way in which we teach and preach. We want you to feel welcome by walking in. We give you a hug, a handshake, say, man, we're glad you're here. Now I'm going to offend you with the Word of God. Because that's what it does. There's not a single elder that hasn't finished a sermon on a Sunday morning and hasn't walked out being like, oh, I stepped on my own toes there. I hope you all feel the same way. And sadly today, it's expected that the church must be a place where all things are accepted? No, 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 not, not here. Not going to happen. Because we take the Word of God, and what it says is God-breathed. And if God says this is a sin, you know what? It's a sin. And, and listen, if you are living in a sin, openly sinning, it's to be pointed out. If a brother or sister finds out that you are openly sinning, what are you supposed to do? Church, what are you supposed to do? You, what if I don't know them that well? No, 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 no. What does the Word of God say? Because we just said all Scripture is God-breathed, right? No way around it. You go to that person. You go to that person. You talk to them. You talk to them. You sit down with them, and then you pray that they repent. That's what the Word is called to do. It's called to show us our sins so that we can repent of those sins, so that we can turn from those sins. And it may even get a bit dirty at times, having to deal with that. But, but I'm going to tell you something right now. As a church, we, we cannot deal with a brother or sister openly living in sin. What are you going to do? Start calling everyone out if we, if we have to? I want to glorify God. That's what we have been called to do as a church body is to glorify Him. And we hold to His Word no matter what. Because what's beautiful about turning from your sin, repenting of that sin, knowing that that sin debt has been paid in full. If it's from God, we call it out. We're called to rebuke that brother or sister. 
Remember, church, it's God who is holy and not man. What he says goes. And it's out of love that we rebuke sin. It's out of love that we work with that person when that sin is called out. It's not loving leaving that person in their sin and remaining quiet. Okay. Come back next week for correction. We're going to hit correction next week, all right? Correction next week. Let us pray.